My name is Ewan McComiskey, I'm the Health Informatics Lead for the UK at the CSP and uh, what I'm going to talk to you tonight is a little bit around about information, uh, innovation and implementation in terms of digital physiotherapy. Uh, you'll see my, my Twitter handle there, please feel free to, to reach out to me on there as well and I'll sure, share some other contact details towards the end. Okay, so if one good thing comes out of COVID, it's going to be the spark that we've needed for years, if not decades, to deliver proper digital healthcare. And to be part of that, we need physiotherapists to be leading. Those that collaborate and improve will prevail, and we want physiotherapists to be those who can collaborate and improve. We want physios to lead for in, in the digital healthcare, we don't want physios to be led into digital healthcare. So we want you guys and the rest of the profession to, to lead for the rest of us. So what's happened in the last few weeks? Sometimes good just to kind of step back and take note of it. So in terms of the response to COVID uh, in the yeah, eight weeks since, since proper lockdown, um, what we've seen is services move to digital solutions in places overnight and in other places over a, a matter of days. We've seen change that usually takes months, if not years, take hours, if not days. And that's a big thing. And, and we can't lose sight of that. The other thing that's really important that's helped to smooth out some of that change is the cultural shift that we've all been part of and the acceptance of digital. And that's not just from a clinical perspective, that's also from a patient perspective. We all have elderly relatives or um, or neighbours or, or, or friends who are now making the most of technology that they never would have done before. Unfairly, we would often um, say the elderly can't use technology and that's absolutely not true. My 91 year old great aunt uh, who has Parkinson's disease and COPD and is now using uh, FaceTime and WhatsApp to reach out to the family because she's isolating alone. Do you know, she never would have used that technology eight weeks ago, but she's now using it. And she's attending, attended her first Parkinson's disease clinic virtually. And she's got a COB, uh, COPD clinic on Friday that she'll be attending virtually. It's a massive cultural shift into acceptance of, of digital and in technology. And that's really, really hard to do. So again, an unintended, but really positive response uh, to COVID. And what we used to see as really unsurmountable barriers, we're now just seeing as challenges. And more importantly, we're just seeing them as things that we need to solve and solve quickly. So what we thought were barriers then became challenges and very quickly just became risks of implementation. And we managed to, to knock off the stuff that was, was proving really difficult in the past. What is now coming to light is the lack of clinical evidence around about the use of some of these digital technologies. And that's something that we really, really need to get to grips with. We need to evaluate the services that we're now providing uh, using different mediums. So we've proven, hopefully, that services that we deliver face-to-face -face or in physical settings are efficient, productive, safe, secure, clinical evidence, outcome-based, et cetera. We now need to reprove that those things are still the case using digital settings because th there are some additional variables that might affect that. So we need to add to the evidence base. And right now the evidence base is very little because we've never seen anything like COVID ever before. But the other thing is that crisis breeds innovation. So when everything around about us is changing, it's really easy to just add in another little bit of change. But if the whole world around about us is static and steady, one tiny little piece of change can seem almost impossible to do. So we've got to act in this kind of crisis state to be able to make the most of the how people are embracing technology and embracing change. And there are lots of examples of that in physiotherapy. So on the CSP website, the links there, we've got some, uh, some case studies that uh, our members have sent into us using different uh, platforms for different patient groups in different settings to be able to continue to provide their physiotherapy services. So we're starting to see things like uh, remote rehab sessions, virtual fracture clinics. They're becoming more normal now than they ever have done before. Yes, some of them were happening before COVID hit, but this is now the norm for physiotherapy services. Elsewhere, there's been a massive um, reaction to COVID. 
Uh, so on the, the bottom left hand side here, you'll see some 3D pin printed ventilator parts. Um, and that is coming from uh, a, a research center in Italy who were prevent, uh, printing them. And that's what they can print in a day to service some of the ventilators that were obviously at absolute capacity in, in particularly in Northern Italy. Um, and then another, the, the bottom right there is how a scuba mask has been refashioned uh, to, to form part of a ventilator as well. So like you say, crisis breeds innovation. We're starting to see these brilliant new things quickly thought out, trialled and then brought into healthcare. So it's a fantastic response to, to COVID from the technology sector. Other things that we've seen as well, so a company called Rokid, uh, it's a wearables company, and, and that software is now in place um, in, in the US and in China to remotely monitor temperature. So you see it particularly in airports, but also in some of the, the, the large factories that you see in those countries as well. Um, top right, use of wearables to monitor C, uh, COVID symptoms. Uh, it, you know, we're expecting that to increase massively over the next 12 months. Uh, and, and some of the stuff that's out there at the minute, you, you see in pictures here, but bear in mind that innovation moves quickly and these things will very quickly become old news. Um, wearable tracking is now mandatory in Hong Kong. So the bottom right picture there you see, uh, smartly dressed person um, entering in, in Hong Kong airport. Uh, they have to wear um, uh, an ID traceable band and then download a, a, an app on their smartphone so they can um, do some contact tracing. And contact tracing obviously is uh, a fairly hot topic in the UK as well. Bottom left, you see there's the NHS uh, England COVID tracing app, which has been released. Um, much debated um, technology is, is pretty sound, but potentially the, the ethics and the morality of, of Big Brother uh, is not sitting uh, too well with the, with the whole of the population just yet. But technology happens outside of COVID as well. So don't want to just focus on COVID, although I had to, had to make mention, had to drop the C-bomb before too long into tonight's, um, tonight's call. So some of the other great stuff that we're seeing. Top left there is a screen grab from the clinician view of Babylon, which is powered by artificial intelligence. So the physio lead uh, at Babylon genuinely manages artificial intelligence bots. So in, he, he manages humans, he also manages bots. And on this screen, you can see some of those bots. So he has a facial recognition bot. So when that, um, that lady is speaking, the lady is the patient. Uh, when that lady is speaking, the, the clinician can see if she looks scared, if she looks in pain, um, if she looks confused. Uh, and then the clinician can react to that by changing the way that they're speaking, by, by adding another definition or description into there. What you can also see is, is a notes creation bot, which uh, uses speech recognition to write in real time uh, what the, the clinician and what the patient are saying. Within that, there's coding, which happens automatically as well. So the clinician doesn't have to go in at the back end and code anything in there. Um, and, and, and other bots that are going on there as well. It's a fantastic piece of technology. Again, we're just skipping over the fact that Babylon has is, is been challenged in some places around about how their, their business model works, but the technology is fantastic. Top right, attend anywhere. Uh, a lot of you have heard of that, particularly for the students and the physios that are joining us from Scotland. So every um, territorial and special board in Scotland has a license for attend anywhere. It's probably the best virtual consultation medium that I've seen. The best thing about it is its simplicity. So it doesn't, you don't have to download an app. You don't have to have special software. You don't have to have special hardware for it. It works on just about any um, operating system. Um, and, and it delivers a really simple um, virtual conference between the clinician and the patient. You can add in additional clinicians, you can add in additional patient or patient representatives as well. So you can have multi, um, you know, multiple people joining in those calls. It's a fantastic piece of kit and, and it's rolling out through the rest of the UK and, and uh, worldwide as well. Uh, bottom right is a study that's going on at Warwick University right now about the use of virtual reality in physiotherapy. Other unis are exploring different uses of virtual reality um, and you know to, re to provide remote and immersive physiotherapy and also remote and immersive learning experiences. So the bottom middle, if you like, um, and I know that not all physiotherapy students have to wear a um, shirt and tie to the lectures, but that is a, a company called Virtuoso. Um, and their platform has gone through 1 million users alone. And that they're, what they're providing there is virtual reality to provide an immersive learning ex environment. So that could be happening at university, that could be happening in the workplace or anywhere else. And then the bottom line, VR for VR, so virtual reality for vestibular rehab. And that's um, 
one of the consultants at Sheffield Teaching Hospital who's using uh, virtual reality gaming to treat visual vertigo. And they're seeing some really, really positive um, outcomes coming out of that. So again, some scope for, for looking into other uses. Other pieces of technology, so top left is uh, cystic fibrosis patients who are using a project called Physio, uh, F-I-Z-Z-Y-O, which uses gamification of what are pretty boring um, CF breathing exercises, uh, and they have been shown to improve motivation and compliance with exercises. So these two chaps are, are running through some of their uh, um, their exercises on their devices, and you see the screen in front of them, they're able to um, to, to use gamification to make it a wee bit more fun. And despite what their faces say, uh, patient satisfaction and experience is really positive in that. Um, top right is uh, an example of relatively simple augmented reality, uh, which is uh, an, an upper limb physio, which is coming from Calgary University uh, over in Canada. Uh, again, just using uh, a bit of feedback to try and get that chap to um, join in and, and comply and, and be motivated to complete some of his, his exercises. Bottom right, we talked about um, technology and learning environments, so using augmented reality in this case um, to, to, to bring to life um, the, the, the patient simulator experience. Um, so they're able to be a wee bit more interactive, a wee bit more real and improve the, the, the student's learning. And then bottom left is a, a project called Microsoft HoloLens, which has been going on for a number of years now, um, but really bringing in the possibility of augmented reality anatomy teaching and how we can, we can um, take up different parts of the body, look at different views to give you a real immersive learning um, experience. And that's not just at uni a university, but also uh, going into the workplace too. So what, what does physiotherapy look like in 2020? Well, it looks a lot different this month as it did in February. That's for sure. But February 2020 to November 2009, when I first qualified as a physiotherapist, doesn't look an awful lot different. So health physiotherapy in 2020, before COVID, wasn't that tech-enabled. It is more tech-enabled now, but we want technology to be part of the new normal for physiotherapy. So we want to promote digital first, but not only. Remember your hands, your ears and your eyes are really important tools to be, to be used in physiotherapy as well. So it's not digital um, only, but certainly digital first. There are also patients, there are also conditions, there are also environmental um, settings that don't work, don't lend themselves well to technology and that's fine. But there's loads and loads of settings and conditions and patients and clinicians that could really be empowered by digital and that's what we're trying to bring together. So we wanted to be part of the new normal. There are some pioneers out already there. So what we tried to do is bring those pioneers together. So we've created something called the Digital and Informatics Physiotherapy Group, the DIPG, and we're absolutely learning from uh, the people who've been at this for a long time. So I'm not the first um, to, to be interested as a digital physiotherapy, neither is Pete, but we're standing on the shoulders of people who've gone through before that. Started life with 30 enthusiasts in a room at CSPHQ in February of 2019. Um, and it was just bringing like-minded folk together. What we developed was a DIPG. It was led by the people in the room that day just to share learning challenges, solutions and opportunities uh, within digital physiotherapy. It's for the people, by the people, and I'm not going to spring into Les Mis uh, with that, but what it, it is not controlled by the CSP. We facilitate it, we support it, but we don't control it. It's, it's to bring the people together. We have members from all four of the home nations and abroad and across all those different sectors and different levels of their physiotherapy careers and job titles and roles and importance and all these kind of things. It's just like-minded people brought together. What we've already done, so a mailing list a group of active members. Um, so I put these slides together on, on or finalised them on Monday. Since then, it's gone through 280 people signed up. That mailing group, we're now approaching 2,600 members of an ICSP channel. The Digital Physio Series, so 14 digital topics, uh, co-authored by 45 members of DIPG. That went live last night uh, on the CSP website. Uh, the app library went live just uh, in the middle of March, toward the end of March, sorry, should say, and all DIPG members get a free pro license of that for three months, which means not only can you recommend apps, but you can actually push apps to um, users' um, devices. 
and then the digital case studies that we talked about a wee bit earlier. Other stuff that's in progress you can see on the screen there and some exciting stuff planned for the rest of this year. Um, obviously some of that is COVID dependent but um, if you want to join the DIPG then you can be part of some of those things. Um, you can see there uh, the screen grab, um, which is the, the new resource, the digital physio resource uh, on, on the website, which they said went live last night. If you want to join the DIPG, please get in touch with me. My email address is there, or you can get me on Twitter. And in terms of Twitter conversations, hashtag digital physio is where you can, you can join some of, of the conversation on that. At the minute, we don't have that many students as part of the DIPG. I'd love to have more. So if you're interested, please get in touch with me. We can get you added to that and get you involved in the group. Um, that's all I want to say for just now. But I want to hand over to one of our elite members of the DIPG, Pete Grimberg, who can give a, give a, a, a more flowing um, description of who he is and, and what his role is. No, I'll take a lead, you, and that's fine. <laughs> um, hi, guys. Uh, Steph, you, and thank you very much for inviting me um, to talk. And everyone who's here, I hope you find um, this session useful. And it's a real honour, actually, to be able to talk. Um, don't quite often get the chance. Talk to a lot of physios in the trade, uh, but not, not those that are still training. So it's actually a real privilege to be able to talk and share some of my experiences. So. Um, I think you guys, uh, Steph, were interested in, in kind of my, I guess my journey to where I am today. So I'm happy to um, talk you through, I guess, where I began and um, what, what my kind of experiences are today and I guess what I've been up to of late. So I, I'm a physio, um, as I said, I qualified back at the beginning of 2000. Um, and I was a student at Birmingham University. Um, thoroughly enjoyed training. Um, I found it very different to what I maybe thought it was going to be like, but I nonetheless thoroughly enjoyed um, my training at, at Birmingham. Um, I think I was quite a typical um, a physio coming into the, into the kind of university setting, thinking, oh, I just really want to work in sport. That's where all the you know, all the glamour is and all the excitement is. And I was very fortunate enough to be able to be given an opportunity um, pretty much straight out of university, actually, to, to go and work in elite sport. Um, and uh, that was at a, um, at the time, it was a premiership football, football club. It's not anymore, but um, it, it was uh, a very eye-opening experience. I think I learned very quickly um, working in in that environment that actually on the ground things are very different to what you may be learning in university but um, nonetheless a very interesting place to kind of um, hone my skills um, very fast paced and I think maybe that's where I kind of my eyes were opened actually to the the acceptance of technology in, in, in a strange kind of way because when you work in elite sport money is no problem um, if you want you know examinations or tests or the latest gadgets you get to play with all that sort of stuff uh, because people are willing to throw money at things that might you know speed up recovery and get people back on the pitch and and that that was the name of the game obviously um in in that environment but i think i did two or three years in in that field and then actually felt like i was wanting a little bit more um and decided to to leave the football club and actually set up on my own, I was maybe a little bit brash thinking I can just go into the big bad world of business and set up my own clinic, but that's, that's what I did. Um, and taking some of my skills from, from the football club and the way that we were very much, the way that we delivered things and the kind of, the, the way that we infused our um, football players um, actually enabled me to quite quickly build a clinic uh, fairly rapidly. So actually, took a clinic from, um, at the time, a one, a one site operation to one that within four years was actually operating in 35 locations across the UK. Uh, we had 70 odd staff. Um, it was all a bit crazy. It was a lot of, lot of learning on the ground, a lot of mistakes made in terms of how to do things, how not to do things from a management and a kind of business running perspective, but certainly gave me a lot of um, insight into the kind of commercial setting and the commercial world of physiotherapy and also I guess uh, um, an interesting view on 
where some of the problems lay with with physiotherapy and for me things were at that time quite clear that there was a massive void of even at that stage there was a big void of technology in, in the industry generally you know things like online booking for, for physiotherapy appointments and just having exercises that you could send out to people were all things that you know weren't weren't available so i guess through some of the um uh through some of the annoyances of having to run a business in a way which was potentially not very efficient because you had to you know, do telephone bookings and send letters to people. I, I very much was interested in how could we speed up you know, access to physio and how could we give better tools to our patients and, and really in exploring some of those areas, kind of started to think actually there is a bit of a hole here. And, and I think generally the medical industry is quite a long way behind in terms of technology. And, and it's probably for a good reason in that it takes a long time to justify you know, new um, initiatives. And I think you and you touched on it um, about having sufficient evidence, which is very important. Um, but I think sometimes that can also get in the way of innovation because it can, um, if it's not done in a way which is, um, if it's not done properly, it can get in the way of innovation and actually slow down adoption of new technology. And I think, as you rightly pointed out, you and there's been probably more done in the last four weeks than there has been in the last four years of, of digitizing healthcare, uh, particularly physiotherapy. So I was always quite interested in physio. Um, I, I got to a point when I was working in that business where I'd done a number of things. We'd introduced an online exercise um, library that we gave to our patients. Um, I didn't have the foresight at that point to try and commercialize that, that product. I wish I had because uh, there are quite a few of them now that obviously offer that kind of service. But that was more for me about actually just providing a good solution for our patients. And I think for me, that's always been the key thing is like, how do you get more, how can you give more back to your patients and how can you actually give people a good user journey, a good user experience of actually accessing physiotherapy services. Um, and I decided that I'd come to a point where I actually was thinking about doing something a bit different. So I, in 2015, actually sold that business, went to work for a digital health, or sold my business to a digital health company and was then involved in a number of different products, um, not in physiotherapy, actually in, in GP, virtual GP provision and some other services. And, and that really did open my eyes to, to what technology can, can do and how technology can really just aid and accelerate people's access and their recovery times. And I started to become very interested in how we might be able to use technology, some of the new and emerging technology at, at the time, um, and things like chatbots and obviously machine learning, which actually is quite an old concept, kind of computer modeling to be able to do predictions and uh, probabilistic reasoning and all that sort of stuff is, is not, not actually very new, but I think it was becoming kind of much more interesting, you know, with the likes of Babylon and some of the other players in that market. Um, and Again, a couple of years in, into that journey, I thought actually I got an idea here that I think could work and decided to um, go and raise some money uh, for a new business idea that I had um, dreamt up with um, another colleague of mine. And that was the idea of the company that we now run called Equal, which is uh, an abbreviation EQL, which is actually a bit of a geeky thing. There's, there's a database language called SQL, and we quite like the idea of equal being this kind of, you know, let's remove the barriers of access to healthcare. Let's Everyone should be given the right to have equal access to healthcare and equal access to the right kinds of treatment. And it didn't feel like that was the case. So um, that's kind of where the bigger idea for, for, the, for the brand came. Um, but actually, the, the product that we were conceiving was a product called Fio, um, which I uh, have um, worn a T-shirt for you guys so you can get familiar with the brand, hopefully. But um, yeah, Fio was, was this idea of, well, OK, so if you've got a back injury and, you know, what, what happens if you've got a back injury? Well, the first thing that happens is you have to know that you've got a back injury. You have to understand that you've got pain and that it's problematic and typically that can take a period of time most people hang around for weeks before they do anything about their injuries and and for me that was a bit of a missed golden opportunity 
So that was kind of problem number one. Problem number two was that, okay, what, what, what do you do when you decide you want to do something about it? Well, you might call your GP or you might call your insurer or you typically have to speak to someone. And then you might then have, a, have another appointment with your GP. So that takes a couple of weeks. You go and see your GP. Um, and as we know, 30% of all GP appointments are in relation to back, back and neck or muscle and joint problems. And the GP quite rightly says, okay, off you go, you need some physiotherapy. You then potentially have to wait for your physiotherapy appointment. Um, and then when you arrive at the physio, typically for, for lots of injuries, your best course of action is, yes, potentially some manual treatment, but actually for a lot of people, it's here's some exercises, go and get on with your exercises, you know, come back in a few weeks. And, you know, so we're looking at all these time frames, thinking, well, hang on a minute, why does it take this long to effectively be given a, a kind of management program that is in, in essence a kind of self-directed management program and could we use technology to actually speed up that process and that's where the idea for FIO came and effectively that's now what we've gone and built so we've actually built um, a chatbot in fact I'm going to show you what we have currently um, and you and you mentioned the, the speed of it of acceleration in the industry we we started this journey in 2018 um, and we were in development for obviously quite a long time. We actually went live with our first customer for our triage products in, um, uh, I think, eight, seven or eight weeks ago. Um, and we now currently, we have signed a few extra, well, I say signed, we had um, contracts that were in the pipeline that were accelerated through as a result of, of COVID. And we now actually have a solution which is available to just over 8 million people in the UK, primarily through people who um, provide services to the NHS. So that's our kind of FIO proposition, our triage tool, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, let me just get my screen up. I'm hoping to show you a few things actually, um, things that we're working on at the moment which are I won't say top secret, but they probably <laughs> probably shouldn't be showing uh, everything. I'm happy to talk about some of the, the cooler products that we're looking at. But um, essentially, the product that we built is a product called Fio, and, and the way that this works is one of our customers that we've um, that we have uh, live at the moment. But essentially, you can self-refer um, with a lot of um, areas in the NHS currently into physiotherapy. But again, typically, you have to have a phone call with someone, and it takes a few days to get the information. Um, so we wanted to speed that journey up. So we built a chatbot that can actually take you through a, an injury um, triage assessment and can actually provide via a clinician. So we essentially capture information for a clinician to then review, but we can give it to them in, in a lot quicker time frames within minutes, obviously, of them completing these assessments. Um, an indication as to which care pathway they need, whether that's back to their GP or to their um, uh, back to their GP or to a uh, diagnostic center or whatever it might be um, we actually can do that quite quickly and we can provide this solution to people at any time um, it can actually be accessed in any language which is some of the stuff that I can show you shortly but it essentially walks people through uh, an assessment or a pre-assessment that enables uh, a clinician to very quickly put them into the right care pathway and obviously the, the the value proposition here is that it can be done in hours and not and not potentially in weeks we actually have people that access the service uh, i think the, the the most extreme one was at 3 30 in the morning uh, it turned out they had um a pretty complex regional pain syndrome but still they're happy to sit there and enter all their information and where else would they be talking to someone at 3.30 in the morning about how you know, debilitating their condition is? So um, this is our, our kind of current version of, uh, of Theo. Um, and as I said, it provides a report to a clinician that can then be uh, accessed and um, actioned upon. Okay, well, I'm, I'll skip on to the next bit because I'm conscious of time. But um, essentially, the, 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 the bigger picture for Theo is, okay, well, can we actually provide a solution that's for people that can effectively self-manage? And the idea is that they can just go straight into a journey that is then um, pushing them through a recovery um, process of exercises. And we use clever technology as well as clinical oversight to monitor things like 
you know, how they're recovering their pain levels, any adverse inflammatory responses. We can track activity and do various other things. And this is a kind of sneak peek of our, of our app and the sorts of things that we're looking to develop. In fact, we are in the process of developing and, and, and about to go live with. So we're really excited about um, Theo as a, as a product. We think that actually with early intervention, we can capture potentially up to 60% of MSK injuries. The idea here, by the way, is not to take people from conventional services, but actually to support the NHS. You know, when you've got a four month waiting list for physiotherapy and potentially you can provide people with um, treatment that actually enables them to get better within that four month period, then, you know, in certain, it, to a certain extent is negligent that you wouldn't want to do that. So we're, we're very much about supporting um, the profession and, taking those people that potentially would sit in clinic and um, are just really appropriate for exercise or really just need to do a bit more movement and get a bit more active, actually taking them out of the conventional healthcare system so that those people that really do need therapy and services can actually go in and, and provide, be, be provided that care. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I think I mentioned the amount of people that currently are at, that have access to FIO um, as a triage solution. That's just over 8 million currently in the UK. Um, we've got some international um, exposure where we hope to see that, that figure grow quite substantially, but we're pretty comfortable. We're pretty happy that, you know, just over 12% of the population actually now has access to our, to our service. And arguably eight weeks ago, they didn't have access to that, that service. So we, it was, to a certain extent, um, it was planned but, um, to, to have this many people. But yeah, I think the current situation really has just opened people's eyes to, to the need for this kind of digital first intervention in order to free up frontline and primary care services. Um, I, I wanna, wanna briefly show you some cool stuff that we're working on. So we've recently um, brought on uh, a, Bit of a superstar in the machine learning and AI world, actually co-lead at Babylon, former co-lead at Babylon. You mentioned Babylon you in your presentation, but a guy called Yura Perov, um, who is a very experienced, very intelligent um, uh, data scientist, and he now heads up our AI and ML provision. And we're actually in the process of working on a prototype, which is actually a differential diagnosis tool. Um, using artificial intelligence in order to create a diagnosis and also care pathway people. Um, Welcome to EQL's Diagnostic and Treatment AI for Musculoskeletal Conditions. I might just turn the audio off because it's a bit annoying. Um, but you can see, it's just a prototype, but you can see actually we're creating a differential diagnosis here. This, again, uh, this is actually a prototype. It's used, does have some clinical data in it, but it's not, um, it's not completely tested or anything. It's just really to show off some of the kind of functionality we're looking to develop. But in essence, this is the kind of thing that you can do with technology. You can actually build out these probabilistic reasoning models that enable, and you can see here on the, on the right hand side, this is just modeled to whiplash at the moment. Um, but you can see actually that it's looking at incidence data and it's actually trying to work out effectively. The, the, the AI is working out um, we have an NLP um, module here that allows me to just type in random things and then it will go away and find uh, what those things are. But yeah, it's, it's some of the stuff that you can potentially do. And again, we hope that this will really speed up, um, further speed up and further power our kind of uh, triage proposition. Um, but we're very excited about this. Um, albeit it does, doesn't look as pretty as some of our other products because obviously it's not gone through the kind of user interface design yet. But, um, but yeah, uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of a snapshot as to um, some of the things we're working on. And yeah, happy to, to uh, leave it there unless there are any questions or you want me to go into any, anything else. Happy to take questions and I uh, hope you found it interesting. Um, we have some questions that are specific to your system so um the first one was is is it free is fio free if not is there a membership or subscription offer so it's it's a it's a purely uh, b2b product so it's free if you happen to live uh in one of the areas that we are currently live and to put me on the spot that is gredford ben uh, bedford um greenwich hull lincolnshire oxford's 
um, to name a few, uh, Westminster. So if you happen to be an NHS uh, resident in any of those areas, you can access Theo currently for free as a triage solution. And another question, um, will this be available in other languages other than English? Uh, yes, it is technically available in 120 different languages. That answers that. Um, and another one for you, and then I'll go to you. And um, how do you regulate who signs up for to FIO? And are there any issues regarding GDPR, given that there are several disputes regarding the amount of information we collect? Um, there's been some stuff in the news around Alexa and text messaging. Yeah, and we have to be very clear with our. Um, there's a number of things we have to be very clear on. So. There's a lot of standards we have to conform to, obviously GDPR being one of them, cyber securities, um, IG toolkits, a number of different uh, matrix. I mean, thankfully providing services to the NHS means that you never get to short track any of that. You have to be very tight on all of your uh, information security um, and being very transparent and honest about the information that we collect, obviously the reasons why we collect it, how we store it. Uh, yeah, that all has to be very transparent to the patient to the customer that we currently, that, that we contract with, um, so that we can be clear on how that data is used. Um, and yeah, I think it's really important that people understand what's happening to their data. Um, and I think it's important that people who provide medical services have access to medical data in order for them to provide services that can assist and help expedite recovery. That's my opinion anyway. Um, and I, I would have that opinion, but I do think it's an important thing and as a business working in digital health, we have a responsibility to set the temp to kind of set the bar there in terms of, you know, the, the, how we use data, why we use data and being very transparent about the benefits and the reasons we, that we do use people and look at data. Um, the main priority for us is obviously getting people back to full recovery and getting them the right care that they need. That's our main priority, obviously. Thanks, Pete. Um, a question, I think, for you, Ian. So, is it difficult to bring up innovative ideas when on placement? And what would you advise to students in that situation? So, sadly, yes, it often is difficult for students to raise uh, innovation ideas when they're on placement, or, or for that matter, when you come out as a newly qualified physiotherapist. Um, and, and quite frankly, that's just not good enough. You know, the, your, your ideas, your innovation shouldn't be stifled. What we should be providing for our students and for our newly qualified physios and for any member of the physiotherapy team is an opportunity to think out some of those ideas. Some of them might be rubbish, let's be honest. Um, but the way to, 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 to get through that process is to practice. It's like anything else. So you have to go through the process of, of innovating to come up with a really good quality um, product at the end of it. Some companies, so I mean, Google X, which is, you know, um, Google's, um, sorry, Microsoft X, which is uh, Microsoft's kind of innovation hub, they actually reward failure. So that sounds a wee bit bonkers, but that just, uh, if you reward failure, it means anything that does come through a success has been absolutely um, quizzed and tested and innovated as, as best as it possibly can before it becomes a product. So they reward failure because if you keep doing that, then you encourage people to come up with new ideas. If we um, incentivize those innovative ideas, then it encourages people to come up with more. If we stop them, then that's exactly what they'll do. So the ideas will stop and the people will stop. What we want is more folk like Pete coming up with great ideas, having the wherewithal, having the, the guts, having the, you know, the... The, the commitment to, to really go through with some of these ideas and give us stuff that we aren't seeing anywhere else. If we keep doing the same old thing over and over again, it ain't going to work. So we need to be able to try and support innovation. And that's partly why the DIPG was set up, so we can provide a, another network, another place where people can try out some ideas and not be scared with, but it might turn out rubbish. Do you know what? If it does, fine. You've got another idea. I guarantee you, everyone on this on this call right now will have at least three ideas of how to improve a service that they've seen, that they've been part of, or that they've received as a patient. So you've all got ideas, and we need to try and um, support innovation rather than stifle it. So the other thing is a pet peeve of mine, never, ever, ever go into a placement thinking or into a workplace thinking that you're just a student physiotherapist or you're just a band five physiotherapist. 
that's just one of the things that you are. So you, you may have another degree before that. You will definitely have friends and family and interests that that brings from you. You might have other interests. So you might be a gamer and you might have some interest through that or some skills and knowledge you could bring in through that. So there's lots of things that everybody brings to the table. So no, don't ever think that I'm just a student physio or I'm just a band five. That, that's not acceptable. Um, you've got ideas. The DIPG could be another area where you can start to to grow those ideas into a thing. And and who knows, we could have another wee, a DIPG baby, we call them, you know, so innovative ideas that turn into platforms or products, um, you know, that, that start off life as it's just an idea between a couple of like-minded members of DIPG. Thanks, Ewan. Um, a related, um, well, it's quite sort of related um, question from Chloe. Do you think this should be included as in digital physio? Um, more on undergrad programs to empower students to think more about innovation? Short answer is yes. <laughs> but to qualify that a little bit, what we don't want, and nor do we have space to fit it in, is a module around about digital physiotherapy. It's not a separate thing that we do, it's a thing that we are. So what I would like to see is that digital physiotherapy is included across all of the existing modules in undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Um, so that we're, we're, we're continually delivering the different way of looking at the physiotherapy world. So when we're talking about professionalism and confidentiality, we're thinking about GDPR. When we're talking about service uh, improvement, we're thinking about how we gather good quality data, how we use it, how we promote it, how we share it. When we're talking about um, how we write notes. So you know, back in the day when I was sat in front in, of, of videos and writing soap notes, let's just move that into something a wee bit more technical. Let's have people input into a, 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 an electronic patient record system. So there are different ways to do it and we just need to, to find ways to embed digital across all parts of the curriculum. Um, and that's partly why we have the, um, the new resource, the digital physio resource and uh, the digital physio series that's just published, you know, as I said last night, to try and give people another um, set of information to be able to, to to support the learning not just as a student but also as you come out into the workforce as well really important that you don't just stop learning when you get your degree certificate it's just the start of of the rest of your life's learning thank you Ewan. um we've got quite a few questions so um just a polite request to um answer them briefly um, i don't do brief stuff you know that <laughs> no, no try okay so um we got a question which maybe both of you could respond to how can you implement these services to individuals that may have disabilities that prevent them from engaging in therapy um, so it could be learning difficulties um, or other types of disabilities yeah i'm happy to go briefly on that we are, we're looking at a number of uh, access points um we mentioned some of them in the demo but um audio um so that you can hear uh, the ability to be able to just speak and of technology to be able to listen and interpret and then um, transcribe um, and read back potentially. Uh, it's really important to us that we address obviously all areas of the public where possible. Yeah, I'll just add to that as well. So people with disabilities, whether they're physical, um, uh, mental or, or anything else, they innovate and they adapt to things all day, every day. Um, so there's no reason why, why technology uh, is, is going to be a barrier for them. In, in fact, a lot of people uh, who, have, who live with disabilities or live with long-term conditions are completely reliant on technology. So that, that's actually a hotbed of innovation ideas from, you know, from a patient group that can help to, to drive what we do as clinicians. Thank you to both of you. Um, so it seems that, that a lot of the current technology is more geared for MSK, especially virtual clinics. Are you aware of any services that are using for example, wearable devices to support the flow of patients from the acute setting? I, I can take that one. So, so yes, there are a number of platforms. A lot of the technology is around MSK, um, but it's fair to say that's a fairly large chunk of, of UK physiotherapy provision. Um, so it's understandable. Um, to generalise a little bit, MSK is also quite easy to fit into boxes. So with short-term conditions where there are existing pathways, if that's your single presenting condition, then that's quite easy to innovate and create technology for. The real challenge is where things are a wee bit more nuanced, a wee bit more individual, and, and that can be their presentation in acute services, inpatient services, or, or through different um, 
uh, condition pathways. So it's more challenging, but there is still success out there. So uh, my M Health uh, are uh, it's a kind of multi-condition platform. So there's an offering there for cardiac conditions, for COPD, for diabetes, uh, for diabetes, for asthma, a number of other things. Um, there's quite a lot going on around about brain injury, spinal injury, um, stroke care as well. So it's it's not just limited to MSK. There are there are lots of really, really interesting things going on out there. Again, shameless plug, DIPG are some of those folks that are doing some of that groundbreaking work in all different settings and sectors of physiotherapy. So so get in touch with them and find out what is going on. Thank you. Um, we've got a question asking, um, is there any advice for final year students applying to work and how they can implement digital health into practice if this isn't already adopted? So, like I said, you're never just a newly qualified physio, never just a student physio. So if you've got a good idea, sound it out. It does take a bit of bravery to do that, um, but perhaps the DIPG can support you to do that. Um, and you never know, that might just kind of perk up some interest in, uh, you know, in, in some other people who are sitting in that room with you. When I was a physiotherapy um, lead, um, there's nothing I hated more than a silent student or a silent band five. I'd rather they gave me ideas rather than, than, than sit there and agree with what I was saying. So so we, we want innovators, we want people who think a wee bit differently um, because it's, it's, it's a really positive environment to work in when you do have that. Um, so and, and also in terms of career steps, um, if I had a band five that was working with me who was come up with lots of good ideas, then I'm going to sit up and I'm going to notice them. So physiotherapy is a small world. And when that band five name comes up in band six recruitment, I'm going to be thinking that that's, that's a person there with a heck of a lot of good ideas. And that's the kind of person I want to work with. So, so ideas help your, your career op opportunities. Um, and, you know, certainly, uh, Pete's talked about it already in, in some different environments and uh, people who think differently are really, really, really rewarded for it. Um, so, so don't just think about what happened in the NHS. Innovation technology could lead you to working outside of that as well. I think what this has really highlighted that there are lots of questions, there's lots of eagerness to know more. So this is absolutely the right time for students to join the group, to, to do this while you're a student, you know, get in, build your networks, um, build your knowledge and your confidence about this subject matter so that when you get into the workplace, you, you have that ability to, to raise those questions and to suggest. So that really seems to be the, um, the resounding uh, message of today. Thank you so much to Pete and to Ewan for your time, for sharing all that you're doing. It's, it's really fascinating and like you said, now is the time to really get on board with what digital physiotherapy is up to. Just want to say thanks to you Steph for, for pulling it together and, and thanks very much for the, uh, for the questions, for the interest from, from the attendees as well. Really, really positive. Um, my email was up there, my Twitter handle was there, feel free to reach out to me if there's anything you want to talk about directly or ideas that you've got. If you want to join the DIPG, get, get in touch with us. But thanks for having us and um, great to see so many people interested in the digital physio. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. If anyone's got questions, feel free to reach out to me either on LinkedIn or uh, through my newly created Twitter account, um, which is at Pete Grinbergs. Um, be more than happy to, to speak to any of you.